Josh Weston. This is Mareko Malmazi. It's me. What's up? How's it going, everybody? This is a dream come true for me. <laughs> um, it's actually my dream. It's your dream? And I manifested it in my uh, sleep. Are we inception level dreaming here, then? Might be. Might be. Um, Mareko Malmazi. I'm just going to give a little introduction to my take on him. But here it comes. <laughs> so, no. a wonderful <laughs> knife maker. Um, saw his work years ago and instantly fell in love with what he had going on and uh, I love seeing what he does and what he's making and how he's pushing and doing things in the knife making world and community so I'm really very happy that you were able to sit down and we can have 10 chill minutes together at Blade Show. Yeah man, Okay. Happy to be here. So, um, let's start out, with a general question yeah. or a general topic, you did a pattern welded Wednesdays for a while, are you still doing those? I did do Pattern Well of Wednesday for a while, so essentially what I was doing was a walkthrough of how I develop or think about developing my designs, and the idea is that it helps people give some tools to make it their own masters. Uh, I realized that wow, the way I think about developing and creating the patterns is very different uh, from how a lot of people do it, um, and that, I don't know, I, I, could just, I, I can look at basically any pattern and reverse engineer it about 10 seconds. And I like, don't know why, but I can show you how it works. I just don't know why my brain has it. So I, did, I was doing that for a while. Uh, I've gotten away with from it um, just because I've become overwhelmed yeah. more than anything. But I do want to get back to it and actually go a little bit deeper. So not only do a walkthrough, but then talk about a step and then cut to forging that step out. So you can actually see what some of these different processes are. Because I use terms like forging on the bias and all kinds of stuff, like book matching this deal. I'm like, what does that mean? Yeah. So if I can actually show you, then that's really going to be a lot more useful and helpful for a lot of people to see that process. And I think that'll be absolutely brilliant. And I um, watched the effect that that has had on the community and you can literally see the difference in smiths that are watching your work increase leaps and bounds from you doing those pattern welded Wednesdays. Yeah. So, I mean, it was, uh, I think it's a huge thing for you to have done for and, and are, you know, eventually going to continue to do with the knife community and, uh, and on behalf of all of us, thank you for that. Um, we, we all appreciate that and one My day maybe I'll actually pleasure. get to uh, go through one of those and, and work through some of that. Um, I get some time. I, mean, I won't. <laughs> when do you have time? Yeah. When do I ever uh, have time? So that's cool. And then um, kitchen knives in general. Yes. You know kitchen knives. I know kitchen knives. And you know chefs. And you know about them. Like, you, let's talk about them. Let's talk yeah. about them. So I've, I've asked a couple chefs what are good knives to have. Um, and they give me general shapes and designs and things. What I want to know from you, take that a, a step further. What is it, the intricacies about these different knife styles that make them so good? So if you could just break down maybe your three favorite knife kit chef knives and what it is about them that it needs to be on there for it to be effective and good. Sure. So the, to step back a little bit, my background comes from working in restaurants. I worked in restaurants for like seven years, uh, cumulatively. And, you know, I'd go do something else and work in another restaurant and then go something anyways. So I spent a lot of time, as well as working, cooking at home, I love cooking, and so I spent a lot of time doing prep work. Yeah. Um, and so to me, the, the biggest key to me is having uh, a thin geometry at the, at the cutting edge. So what that means is that essentially as, actually I got one of my knives right here, essentially as I drag my fingers from the, from the thick part at the spine out towards the edge, it basically feels like it disappears. And if it does that, what that means is that as you're cutting through food, it's reducing the friction. Imagine, I can't even think, I should come up with a good analogy so I can do this in the future, but anyways, essentially the thicker the edge, the more friction you're, you're coming up against in the initial, even just at the beginning of the cut, but the narrower it is, the thinner the material is at the edge, right behind the primary uh, bevel, it's just gonna glide right through. There's less friction in that initial contact and you're just gonna be able to blast through food all the time. The other thing uh, that I really like about a chef's knife is clearance. Um, at, for the tip, or so, I'm sorry, this actually came from the other direction. So one of the things I hated about uh, a lot of chef's knives that I was using in restaurants is that to have access to the tip to pierce something, you had to crank the knife up really high because they usually, especially more of the European style, they sweep up 
like very abruptly in the last quarter or third of the blade. It sweeps up, and which is a nice style. Yeah, but to have access to that tip, you had to raise it up and do stuff or like this. But I've designed mine so that it's actually more of a Japanese style edge profile while it has more, uh, while it still maintains a European aesthetic. But what happens with this profile is that to get access to the tip, you only actually have to lift it up a couple inches off the off the your cutting surface. And the reason I, I actually when I am grinding my knives and establishing the edge profile, I actually put the tip on a board and I put lift it up until three fingers fit underneath. And I keep cleaning up the tip until it has until it's clear. Because also the last thing you want to do is somebody be doing a rock chop and digging the tip of the, into right. the surface. So as long as you make sure that tip is clear, then you have plenty of clearance. And so if you're doing it, making sure you're only doing it for a couple inches, because to do like to do a rock chop or anything taller than essentially two inches is really awkward. And at that point, most people will actually lift the knife off the board and do what's called a push, push cut, and they'll cut like this for taller things like a bell pepper or a melon or a squash or something like that. So more than anything, just make sure you have clearance actually for a couple iron uh, clearance at the tip for for two inches of clearance back of the heel, and then because you did that, you don't have to crank it up so high. You literally just have to go two and a quarter inches, and now you have access to that tip. And the the goal of that a chef's knife is a general purpose knife, so that means it's designed to do all as many tasks as possible: chopping, slicing, dicing, mincing, as well as if you take it to a finer tip point like this, you can actually do work that maybe a paring knife or a utility knife yeah. would do. So you have a range of tasks in the kitchen. My goal is to design a chef's knife that uh, that crosses over and covers as much of that spectrum as possible. Now, once you get to the outer edges of, sorry, outer edge, <laughs> of the spectrum from uh, paring all the way to uh, slicing, once you get to slicing, like those are the very opposite ends of the spectrum. Or even like breaking down uh, animal carcass or like doing like doing butchery work then like a cleaver like a cleaver geometry on a chef's knife is very specialized so it's not going to work so again essentially i designed my chef's knives to cover as much of that spectrum so one more question yes. before you totally put that away i love your heels aesthetically yes. they're yes. beautiful but i imagine because of the way that you engineer and think there's a purpose to why that comes back the way it does. Sure. Could you elaborate? So this is a feature, so I call it the recurve heels. So essentially, to me, when I first started doing them, it looks like half of a recurve, recurve bow. And I didn't also really, nobody had a good name for it. So I call it the recurve heel because that just it, that describes what's happening. It's going yeah. out and coming right back. Um, this is a, a design feature that comes from Japan. I think the Fujiwara was the first Japanese she uh, chef's knife ma maker okay. that I ever saw do it. And um, people also call it the finger rest now, but essentially what it does is it actually acts kind of a guard as a guard, because once your finger gets up in there, let's see, up in there, it's hard to push your finger out without having to go back and then out. Uh, so as you're working, a, a tendency a lot of people will have is for their finger to slowly start sliding down to the heel, because they're more focused on the cutting and the food, and that's where people have the issues. But if your finger's right there, locked in, essentially, into the blade, you have a little bit of a guard, in a way, that doesn't necessarily, that works as a guard, but doesn't impede the function of the, of the I almost said sword. Yeah, <laughs> the kitchen sword. It's a kitchen it sword. It doesn't impede the function of the knife. And so, because if you did have more of a guard there, what happens is, as the knife is sharpened over time, you have to, uh, you and you work your way up the blade, that guard becomes a big problem when it comes to sharpening, and that's a lot. That's an issue that a lot of people have with a lot of the European uh, integral chef's knives. Yeah. Is that the integral bolster comes all the way down the heel, um, and part of that that's just a, more than anything, it's a re restriction in production. Because if they actually took the time to clean that up a little bit more, so it's more functional, that's more time it takes to produce it. Cost it drives those prices up, and so yeah. they're trying to keep it in the sweet spot for themselves. Yeah. But on a custom level, this is something that you can do to help essentially have kind of like that same effect without without it getting in the way of the function of the knife. Because ideally, it's this, it's, as long as I heat treat this properly and everything's great, over the life of this knife, this will essentially become like a utility knife because all of this material has been sharpened. But 
ground away, uh, and it's still it'll still be functional as a smaller knife, as you've probably seen. Oh shoot, I can't do it this way. As you've seen at like a uh, at a like a antique store or something yeah. like that. You've yeah. seen lots of chef's yeah. knives and stuff yeah. that start as a much bigger knife and they, and they keep going. And that's the way they they design those knives to work that way because. The knives were expensive. Yeah. You needed them to last some work. And yeah. so, shit, we went over 10 minutes. Right? Dude, it's all right because okay. I can edit this and I can okay. break it into three videos. Let's okay. go as okay. long Let's as you feel comfortable. So, um, yeah, so the, they're designed to keep going and going and going. And realistically, like, I, one of the hashtags I love using is Future Antiques of America yeah. as well oh as <laughs> Invest Once. I have seen you use that and I'm going, what, what, what is, is that he mean? talking about? So, what, what that means is I'm trying to build tools. So that you only have to buy the dang thing once, and it's gonna last at least a hundred years. If you take proper care of this, it real actually realistically, in the way I use my knives, even at home, and the amount of uh, sharpening that I do, this could. I did the math, and I was like, holy shit, this could last like 350 years, which is mind-boggling to think yeah. about when we're like, we're stoked if something. Down, yeah. If we're stoked if something lasts five years, but so if I rolled and I'm like okay well I'm gonna give this to my grandson because I'm sure my kids at that point will have their own knives so I'm gonna pass it down to my grandson he has it or they have it and they use it they pass it like it's gonna it actually does yeah. a, a bi-generational thing it could go six generations yeah. <laughs> which is bonkers yeah yeah um that's an excellent breakdown thank you I fucking love it <laughs> sorry it took so long no it's fine I told I love you it. I have a problem with talking. That's to okay. <laughs> I do too. So I'm going to try to say as little because I can talk as well. Sure. Um, Segway. Yes. Next part. Knife talk. Love the podcast. I wish I had listened to it more, but I have a hard time listening to things and working. I'm a music guy. Sure. Um, That's but I, I do listen to it while driving and stuff. So I catch yeah, yeah. up um, behind it. Uh, I, I love it. I think it's one in the, Here's another thing. This is point number two of things that uh, Morocco is really helping to contribute in the knife making community. And I love the work there. How are you enjoying it? I love it. It's great. It's so one of the things that we're at Blade Show right now. And one of the things I love about Blade Show is it gives me a chance to sit and talk with somebody like like buddies like this, like Josh, that I've met through the craft, through doing Forge and Fire, and then coming together and, and connecting in the community that's online, and then actually doing it in person. So. And the, the other thing that's great about Cameron's or other kind of forging events is people coming together. So the, the Knife Talk is an opportunity. I take an hour, actually it's like two hours a week, to sit down with my friends and talk knives and essentially do the same thing we would do here. Share, our, share what we've been up to, stuff we've discovered, figured out, and then try to help other people through answering questions because there are all kinds of questions. And, and thankfully, there, there's been a huge explosion in interest in the craft, but that means there's more questions. So yeah. we just keep answering and, and doing what we can to help the community because that's really what it's all about. Yeah. Was, the thing I love about it the most is it's three people running that that are super qualified to answer those questions. So you know that the answers you're getting are reliable. All right, people? All right. It's Try a good it. source. It's a good source. <laughs> Use it. Um, so, so you mentioned Forge and Fire, so I'm going to yes. leech on that. Sure. Um, one of the things I really admired about you was you went on and you made a chef's knife. That's what you made. So yeah. Like I'm making chef's knife style, and that's a tough test. They're really rigorous on that, and right. you went balls out with what you make yeah. the first time you were on. Yeah. And uh, I have a lot of respect for that. And that was, and you just look so good on screen, bro. I just, I don't know. I just never, you know. Especially in the first season, yeah, we didn't know what to expect. We didn't have anything to watch and see and learn from yeah. before going on, and so yeah, it's just it all. I actually was very nervous about doing the show, and I what I uh, because of talking with a lot of the master smiths and other people, you know, oh, it's gonna be really bad, or they could make you look like an idiot or a jerk, and I'm like, ooh. So I was really nervous about it, but I was like, you know what? This feels like one of those things that have happened in my life, that have passed, that I said, man, I should have done that. And I didn't want it to be that again. Yeah. So I was like, you know what, I'm gonna do it. Uh, and all I can do, but I was still nervous. So so I reached out to a friend who's an executive producer in Portland, Oregon. And I was showing him the contract and talking to him about the thing. And he's like, this is all standard. Look, the way these work is they're gonna take hours and hours and hours of footage. And then they're gonna distill it down to 40, Two minutes, and 
basically what they will get is a caricature of yourself. So, like over concentration of who you are, a distillation of who you are. And so if you just, he's like, if you just be who you are, who I know you to be, I might get emotional all of a sudden. If you just be that person that I know you to be, you're gonna be good and people are gonna like you and you're not gonna look like a jerk because that was my biggest thing. I didn't wanna look like a jerk. I didn't wanna look like I didn't know what I was doing. It's like, yeah, if you're knowledgeable in what you're doing, you should be good. And I did it and it turned out really well. And I had a lot of, I had a very uh, positive reaction from being on the show. I enjoyed it. it was, and, and of course the benefit of meeting and connecting and kind yeah. of developing a, a, a weird kind of private club yeah. right, community of people who've done the show is really great. I, I think for me, um, that community was something that brought me out of the woodwork because prior to Forged in Fire, I, I didn't really know anybody in the community aside from internet forums, night forums for when you're getting help. Um, and uh, I never met anybody and never forged with any other knife makers. Sure. And then I got thrown into this world that was very welcoming and warm. For the most part, I really liked and enjoy everyone that I've met. And it's accelerated my skill as well. Um, so. I have a hard time saying bad things about it. I, I had mixed results. I went on and didn't sell the net three months after my first time on because I missed some critical steps. But <laughs> fortunately, I, I got to redeem myself and, and come back and, and adjust and change and grow. And that's an important part of things, you know, um, keeping a positive outlook and attitude and pressing forward. Um, yeah. and, and kind of building on that, moving forward with you and what you have going on. Um, tell us a little bit about kind of your future plans, what you're trying to get into. And um, I get asked all the time, because people think I'm a full-time maker, and I'm not, because I just literally can't afford to do it. Yep. Um, people think you've been on TV, you must be making it. It's, it's <laughs> so not true, it's, it's not so it. hard. Yep. This, this life, this craft is, um, it's an uphill battle every step of the way. Sure. And, um, you know, I, I look at and follow you and, and, and I see success that you have, but I know that it, appearances aren't always there and not that you're not super successful <laughs> at the placement. You, uh, you do great, but I know no, that I there's know, struggle there. Yeah, so absolutely. talk us through some of that and what it, what it takes to provide that living and stay in this craft that I know is a passion yeah. for life. Yeah, I'm fortunate to have my wife that is very good with numbers, and a very big a very big part of this, uh, if you want to go full time, that I underestimated, um, is kind of like the the uh, administrative side of the business, which is accounting and uh, answering the emails. I'm still the absolute worst about answering your emails. If any of my customers are listening and watching this right now, I'm sorry. I love you guys. Thank you so much for your support. I do everything I can, but uh, but you know, on top of that, it's not, so on top of making the knives, there's all that. Then there's also then the social media side, that's just, which is part of like the marketing and branding portion. God, what it t how hard is it to work and keep up with social media so that you can stay relevant? It yeah. slows you down. The best one of the best things I've found for myself is to, and I'm, I was actually just talking about this to a friend last night. I was like, the best thing you can do is just be consistent. And I think what I think is most ideally consistent is essentially trying to post at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. At, at least once a day, but ideally those three times a day. Um, that way you're not overdoing it, but you're not underdoing it, but you're maintaining a level of uh, consistency and also maintaining people's attention because um, that, that's what it's about, is putting out stuff there that helps interest people in the work that you do as well as sharing information and knowledge that also kind of uh, makes you a resource. Yeah. Like you doing this helps create the uh, transition you into a resource because then you're connecting your audience yeah. with other people that may, they might not have ever met or known or talked yeah. to. You develop a relation of trust and it, it, yeah. it's, 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 there's an inherent openness when yeah. you're willing to share yeah. knowledge and expertise and experience with people, they they see that openness and it is very attractive. 100%. Yeah. And, the, and the other thing that I, I I actually get a lot of guff from people for as for sharing all the stuff I share, especially the Damascus patterns and stuff, because that's usually a very guarded secret how different makers make their patterns and everything. And a lot of folks are like, "What are you doing? Aren't you afraid something's gonna start 
reproducing your pattern and then making knives that look like yours? And I'm like, no, I'm not. Because part of building your social media and your, your brand around yourself is that is the trust, is telling your story, inviting people to be part of the journey, um, whether through it, through just supporting you in like apparel, or sorry, apparel, or <laughs> or or just like sharing something up, or just they don't even have to do anything. They just enjoy it, watch it, enjoy it as a as a form of escapism from the end of their hectic, crazy day. Getting to look at something that I'm doing or you're doing um, that that just really helps them unwind, I guess, basically. Um, oh, so my 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 thing to go along with that antiquated mindset is that that made sense to hold those secrets in when there was a very, very, very tiny insular group of people that they were selling to. Um, but now the, the internet's opened us to the entire yeah. world. There are literally millions of people who are interested in the kind of work that we're doing. Yeah. And because of that, there there is an unlimited opportunity for, for being able to make a living from this. And, and because of that, we're never going to be in competition. No. Not because I think I'm better than you or you, you're better than me or whatever. That has nothing to do with it. It's just there's literally not enough work that we could create to satiate that demand. I, w I was telling someone earlier today, there's what, 6 billion people on the planet. 7.2. 7.2, God, it's gone up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm part of the problem there. <laughs> uh, but anyhow, I, there's, there's two things that I think pretty much everyone has in common in general. Um, toilet paper and knives. Sure. Right? <laughs> we all, at some, at some level, we have to wipe our ass and have to cut something. I don't care how <laughs> liberal you are. I don't care yeah. if it's a ceramic no. knife or whatever. 100%. If you're making food in your kitchen, everybody's using a knife and everybody is cleaning their ass. Yeah. With, with that in mind... I've, I've never thought about that. There's a market true. of 7.2 billion knives that could be made... If, if you just made one knife for each person in the, in the world over the course of their lives, but the general, I, there's, I probably have 18 knives that we use in our kitchen. So, yeah. you know, exactly. the market's there, yeah. and essentially you have got to do these things that you're talking about on social media and planning and prep and getting out to carve out your market to get to. So defining your product, owning yeah. that product, owning that expertise, and making product available and keeping it with things that I struggle with. Uh, I'm sorry to my people who want knives. <laughs> uh, but anyhow, it, it's, a, it's a fantastic point. The market's there. you got to take it. Yeah. And you're doing a great job. I'm trying. And you actually, what I like about you is you are opening markets up for other people. You're opening up markets for me because I know that I can learn from you to make chef knives. I'm not a chef knife maker, but... This man inspires me so much that I have started to make chef's knives. And be, and honestly, him and Neil, because uh, Neil's a big inspiration with me as well, um, to go, all right, well, I don't really make chef's knives, but if I'm going to, I'm going to make it in my weird historical fusion style sure. and go down that ro route. And that's a different market from the chef's knives that you make. So like yeah. you said, we don't have to compete. We can learn, share, and sharpen off of each yeah. other, which is great about this Community. I, yeah. the community. I actually take time before I even started doing the podcast. A portion of the podcast we do is called Community Showcase, where we give somebody a shout out. Before, but before we we even started doing that, I had my Make a Crush Mondays. And essentially, it was my opportunity yeah. to give a shout out to somebody. Or and then I think I did actually a few of them. I did Make a Crush Monday, Tip the Hat Tuesday, and I was just like trying to help introduce the people that were following me to other really great makers because I'll never be able to make all the knives that people might be interested in buying from me. There are plenty of other great makers out there who could be making those knives for them. And so I have no problem yeah. uh, you know, pointing people in your direction or any other maker's direction. Yeah. So that's that's awesome. And um, I know Blade shows a busy time. Yeah. Uh, people want to sell knives and make money and I appreciate you taking 25 minutes out of your time to sit down on the floor and have a conversation with me. Um, Instagram handles. Instagram. Malmasi Fire Arts at Gmail. Or, sorry. That's not. That's my email. Sorry. At Which Mal he doesn't respond to. I don't, so, so don't, don't even bother. <laughs> at Malmasi Fire Arts. Malmasi is spelled M-A-U-M-A-S-I. I'm sure it will be uh, in the show notes. In it. It'll be in the show notes. Yeah. But Malmasi Fire Arts everywhere. Instagram, Twitter, Website MalmasiFireArts.com. Just look me up. I'm, I I I think technically. Oh wait, I'm one of two 
Mariko Malmasi's in the world. The other one is a cousin, a distant cousin of mine. So nice. it's it's I'm fortunate on <laughs> to go back to Forge of Fire real quick. You know, Josh like one of the guys on my second episode, his name is Josh Smith. That is Yeah. I love the yes. guy. Yeah. It is a very common name though. Yeah. I'm fortunate because they only give your first name that Mareko is I'm like basically the only Mareko in the world, Dude, especially making knives. There's I at am... least seven or eight Joshes on Forged and Fire now, and one of them actually has a beard and a haircut like me, so it's like... <laughs> yeah. Actually, I, I learned really quick funny thing. I think I might be the only Samoan, like person of Samoan heritage forging knives in the world. No I'm kidding. Which is really? really weird. I never thought about it. Wow. But Polynesians have a history of doing a lot of music, art, create very great yeah. adventures. But I think I might be the only Samoan doing it, which is a trip. A trip to think about. Um, to not to totally derail, but I yeah. have recently seen some, I think they're Samoan, um, historic knives that I've gotten at Pinterest. I want to float them by you at some point. But um, very cool. Yeah. I have, I have a couple that I want to make, too. Okay. Yeah, there's, super, there's some yeah, really Make them. Make them. I want to see them. Because I'm not going to do it. You're crazy look. looking. You're like. <laughs> yeah. Cultural appropriation, bro. <laughs> he, this guy <laughs> sends me messages all the time. He's like, dude, no. Delete it. What? <laughs> no. Actually, one last I really do. quick story for you. Uh, I don't think I've told you this before, but I found your forging progression for the railroad spike tomahawk. I think like a year before I, you were even on Forge yeah. Fire, I, before I even knew who you were. And it was the coolest thing that I'd ever found, and I, well, I have a bunch of ra <laughs> railroad spikes that eventually one day I want to turn into, but I tried like drifting the mold, I don't know what the hell I was doing, I was just like trying to recreate it from yeah. what, what you put out there, and I loved it so much though, and it was amazing, but the way you spread the beard, and it's... An yeah. incredibly uh, skillful thing to do because it is hard to move material. Now, yeah, right? it's, it's all it's, about it's, managing it's, mass and yeah. moving it around to do a weird thing with a shape that is nothing like a tomahawk. <laughs> no, <laughs> nothing at all. And and lots of people try, and some of them, some of them get it. So, but I just awesome. I said that because I wanted to I let you know that. I've admired your work for quite a long time. Now. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me in here, buddy. I fucking love you, man. I love you too, brother. Bye. Bye.